everyone to the Psychedelics Today show with David Drapkin and today we're talking with Dr. Dominique Marsana. Lovely to see you today. How are you, Dominique? I'm good. How are you? Lovely to Doing be here. Doing great. Yeah. It's lovely to uh, to get this chat happening. There's loads to talk about. Um, and, you know, we've met once briefly at a, at a Horizons, but we've had loads of chat until now. I'm really happy to kind of share the conversation with the world today. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so we've got a very special conference happening um, in Toronto that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, from research to reality. Before we get there, it's only right that we get to know you a wee bit first. So um, we normally ask people in a nutshell to kind of talk about you know, who you are and how your career's evolved and personally, professionally, how you've uh, developed your relationships with psychedelic medicine. Yeah, awesome. Um, so I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, I've been practicing for about 13 years um, in New York and Ontario, mainly Toronto and New York City. And uh, my specialty has been uh, primarily in addiction and trauma over the past, uh, you know, um, 13 to 15 years. And, you know, I was working as an addiction researcher for several years uh, as a professor and wasn't interested um, in working in psychedelics initially. Um, I, I was working in alcohol and cannabis research and uh, was down in, I don't remember if it was Arizona or California or something at a conference, College on Problems of Drug Dependence back in 2008, and met some of the researchers from Johns Hopkins University. And they were talking about psychedelic assisted therapies and became good friends. And um, over the years, they kind of brought me more to the side of the psychedelic assisted therapies and, and convinced me that this was the area to work in. Um, and in uh, 2018, I went back to school at the California Institute of Integral Studies and uh, did the certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies and research pro uh, program there. And uh, my career really shifted after that. Um, so, so I'm a clinical psychologist. I, I teach um, at the University of Toronto School of Public Health. I teach at the University of Ottawa um, School of Psychology, psychedelics class. Um, but uh, for the most part, in the last three years, my career has really become uh, focused on psychedelic assisted therapies. Thanks for, for talking about that timeline because you had a long kind of stewing period, like 10 years, where it was kind of in your mind and you, were, you, were, you knew of it. But mm -hmm. you you kept going with your career like on that other side because you mentioned it being like the other side like there's a psychedelic medicine <laughs> therapy side and then just conventional medicine side I suppose so what was that like having those two sides kind of you know ticking along in your life consecutively that's true yeah I mean I mean to be frank at the beginning like yeah it was like 14 years ago the idea of having a career in psychedelics um, was a bit out there for me um, you know I didn't. I didn't know that much about it. I was I was very focused on my alcohol research, my cannabis research, uh, my my practice, um, and I was like, mushrooms can help, you know, people quit smoking. Hmm. Like mushrooms can help uh, depression and cancer. That's so interesting. Like you know, and and I so I was learning about it, but it's like you know, that's not my that's not where I've been trained. That's not my it's not my jam. Um, and then. Um, and then in 2013, I was working as a scientist um, at this uh, uh, institution in Canada called the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, which is um, actually one of the co-hosts of the conference coming up. Um, and my boss there at the time, Dr. Brian Rush, uh, who is one of the co-founders of the conference with me, uh, told me that he was retiring and he was going to be pursuing uh, more of his interest in ayahuasca research. Um, and... I was like, ayahuasca, what, what is ayahuasca, you know? And, mm. uh, I mean, it, it sounds a bit dumb now, but, uh, you know, back then I, I really didn't understand. And, and he, um, and he explained to me that, you know, this was a, you know, traditional medicine coming from the Amazonian region of Peru, you know, and, and, and different regions of Colombia and Brazil and, you know, and, it was being used to treat addiction and trauma and work with people for spiritual growth. And I was pretty fascinated, you know, and kind of bookmarked it and kind of kept doing my regular, you know, work. And I was working as an implementation scientist at the time, uh, uh, getting evidence into best practice in, um, in mental health and addiction. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of like the, as you said, that it just kept stewing, uh, for mm. the next several years until it kind of hit, 
hit the point of, you know, I, I was actually, this is so cliche, but I was listening to the Michael Pollan book on audio, um, (laughs) on a drive (laughs) and I heard about, you know, the school, uh, in, at at California Institute of Integral Studies. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's what I got to do next. That's my next step. That's it. That's it. You know? And it just made, it just made total sense to me. I had been researching more and more about how they impact trauma and physical health and mental health. And, um, I, it just, it just fascinated me, um, beyond, you know, beyond what I had been exposed to in my, in my, uh, previous, let's say academic career. Yeah. Fascinating. And two things that I've learned from working with students here at psychedelics today is there's a lot of fear about working in psychedelic medicine and therapy. What will people say, you know, is it legal yes. and, you know, how will people react to that? Um, and two, you know, are there viable career paths in this industry? You know, am I taking these courses to actually then have any kind of tangible outcome? Yeah. And so I think that's why a lot of people do stew for a number of years with those two main questions. But I think a lot of people now are, are, are coming back saying, well, yeah, this is, this is legal. This is coming online. There are viable career paths here. So I'm wondering for actually, you and your Eureka. Yeah, go ahead. Go yeah, on. it was actually like a, a real, con- I mean, it seemed, to me, it sounds, it sounds really wild that even, you know, four years ago that this, frankly, like people have been working with these medicines for thousands of years, as we know, you know, um, in indigenous populations around the world. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're learning about them in our, you know, Western academic, uh, kind of institutional with our institutional lens, like in the last, what, like 60, 60 years, you know, no, a little bit more than that, 70, 80 years. Um, and, uh, I think that, um, even three years, three years ago, four years ago, it was still very controversial um, to think about exploring a career in this. And, you know, the the people that I've met at various institutions that were doing research in the area had the, you know, had to do a lot of, I would say, advocacy within their institutions, you know, just to do the research, but it's research. But then as far as clinical practice is concerned, it's a lot more, um, it's been a bit more of a stretch, you know. Uh, coming out of the academic institution into the into clinical practice and saying no, there's evidence for this, like or there's not evidence for this, you know. And I ended up calling my one of my, I ended up calling my insurance, my regulatory college, things like that, like ahead of even going to school uh, to study psychedelic assisted therapies, just to make sure that you know I was going to be okay, you know, um, if I ended up studying this kind of thing, and you know the. I was told, yes, as long as it's within scope of practice, but like, no, you know, you should never, ever be giving anybody medicine yourself, you know? And, um, and I said, of course not, you know? So like, as long as you're doing therapeutic practice, you're practicing as a therapist and you're just doing therapy, then, you know, that, that it is what it is. Hmm. And you, you mentioned, Domi, uh, cannabis in particular in the early days was something that you were working in before kind of the, the psychedelic therapy you know, Renaissance and Michael Pollan's book came out, you know, that was something that's been touched upon for a while. And also ayahuasca, you mentioned, I'm just wondering, are those two things that did and still do interest you most from a kind of a research and practice perspective, would you say? Um, you know, I like a lot of people in the, um, are sometimes surprised to hear this, but I, um, you know, I was really working in cannabis as, um, in terms of its, I would say, negative effects on, um, cognition, you know, that Mm. was what, what, what my research was on. And, uh, for some people with, uh, specific conditions, you know, to see if it was having a, a, uh, you know, chronic, um, and a chronic impact, um, or decline on cognitive ability. Um, and, um, I didn't end up pursuing this, this research, um, beyond my postdoctoral fellowship, um, I was, I was more, um, at the time interested in alcohol research. Um, but in my clinical practice, I work with cannabis dependence. Um, that's one of my areas of specialty and, uh, you know, the, 
10% or so of the population of folks that use cannabis that struggle with it, you know, or that have problems. So, you know, it's about 10% of the the cannabis using population. Um, And when people struggle, they really struggle, you know, um, I would say. So that's been my focus. I'm still very interested in it clinically, still work with it all the time. Um, Think that, you know, uh, um, there's a lot to be learned about uh, the benefits of cannabis um, medically, medicinally, um, and and to learn more about the effects on uh, mental health and uh, uh, different aspects of mental health and um, personality. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Ayahuasca I'm... is something that I've been um, growing my interest in um, over the past uh, few years, uh, learning more about it. And uh, it's one of my co-founders, uh, Brian Rush, is doing some interesting research in um, well, in South America, um, uh, on looking at ayahuasca for the treatment of addiction, it's been, uh, it's really fascinating work. So I think there's, there's a, you know, I think that there's a lot of potential for a lot of different medicines to, uh, be used in conjunction with, um, you know, therapy and, and, uh, in healing practice to help people overcome difficulties that they've been struggling with. That's what I'm here for. Yeah. Yeah, that's great to hear that you're willing to look at the uh, potential dark side or the potential for abuse of psychedelics and cannabis and not just, you know, only focus on the, you know, the the perceived positives. Because I think there's a lot of people out there that think all drugs, psychedelics included, you know, are going to destroy your brain and become this kind of addictive uh, drug. And, and then there's some other people on the other side are saying that these are not addictive at all. And they're purely kind of spiritual, recreational or therapeutic, but, but yeah, I, th- I really feel like we have to cover our bases in, in uh, understanding that there is a addictive potential for some of these medicines more than others, particularly I'd say, you know, say ketamine, MDMA and, and cannabis. I've worked with a lot of teenagers around cannabis dependence in particular. Yeah. Use, just using it too much. Not It's not in a therapeutic healing way. It's in a kind of counter therapeutic and numbing way. But we have to talk about that. Yeah. I think like coming at these conversations from a middle ground is really important. Like looking at the evidence, you know, but also um, looking at the potential, you know, um, paying attention to the evidence and how we kind of shape our clinical practice. But there's also things that we can learn from clinical practice, you know, that aren't yet in the journals. Um, There's things that we can learn from a traditional uh, practice that are definitely not in the journals and probably won't be because they fit a different paradigm of scholarship and, you know, how we think about knowledge and, uh, you know, and just wise practices. So, yeah, we have a lot to learn. So, Dominic, there's a question that we're kind of touching on a bit around indigenous traditions and some of the, the cultures that have used plant medicines in the past. And my understanding, there's particular aspects of that that I think we really miss in the Western culture in general, yeah, outside of medicine and outside of psychedelics. And that's around kind of the community sharing of sacred time and sacred space and the connection to nature. Um, and it might be having circle time with intergenerational um, you know, members of one's nation or tribe or community. And I feel like, boy, do we miss some of that in our, in our Western world. And, um, and I don't know to what extent we can build some of those positive characteristics into the psychedelic treatment model we have in the West. And I know that a lot of people go to places like, you know, Mexico, Costa Rica, Jamaica, Amsterdam, even for experiences that has that slightly different feel to a ketamine clinic, say in North America. But I, my sense is there's something that we could learn from, from some of the traditions that use plant medicines or that just use even say being in that intergenerational circle and using a fire, using music, uh, using being out in nature that's, that is very healing um, and gives a sense of time and place. It's very powerful. So I know that, that you know, you have a, a strong connection to indigenous traditions and some of the research and practices. Anything particular you feel 
that Western folks maybe uh, need or are seeking that could be um, built into either psychedelic models or that might just be, you know, researched a little bit more and brought attention to um, more formally? So, yeah, I wanted to um, just note um, that, you know, when we talk about um, indigenous uh, traditions, um, we're really lumping a lot of uh, different traditions together, um, a lot of different uh, people's ways of knowing values, um, uh, practices, uh, knowledges, you know, and, and, um, and it's, I think that, you know, in general, in the world, uh, we have been, uh, learning from, and to be quite frank, you know, stealing from and taking from indigenous peoples, um, for a long time, you know? And so when we talk about incorporating, indigenous traditions or indigenous knowledge or indigenous uh, wise practices into our work with psychedelics in the, you know, uh, like the Western modern medicine world, you know, I think we have to be really mindful and really careful about how, how we do that, that, you know, and, 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 you know, whether we do that and, and the, like, uh, like wise ways to do that. And, uh, the bulk of our medicines, as you know, we, they come from um, indigenous peoples. Um, they have uh, many, many folks have shared that knowledge with, you know, explorers, with, um, you know, anthropologists, like uh, there's, you know, quite a history uh, there with, you know, with people uh, wanting to understand how to work with this, that, or the other condition. And I think, I mean, if there's like that famous example that even in this, you know, anesthesia came from, um, from, a you know, the medicine on the tip of a dart in the jungle that, you know, was used to kind of paralyze animals. And I think, you know, we can't just pick and choose what we want to gain from, uh, in, in you know, in, indigenous knowledge, um, it has to be gifted to us. It has to be um, given freely. Um, and um, if people want to incorporate indigenous practices into their modern Western clinical practice, I think it should be done uh, in consultation um, with multiple, uh, you know, folks across um, different uh you know, groups of, uh, different, uh, uh, nations and, and, uh, done with, uh, reciprocity in mind. So, you know, what is, what is, uh, what is the, you know, exchange there? Um, and, and how free is it? Um, I think that for many people, uh, in different traditions, um, you know, nobody really uses, I don't think a lot of people ever use the word psychedelics in a lot of, uh, you know, indigenous communities. It's, it's like, these are medicines and they're, and, um, more medicines than psychedelic medicines are used, uh, more plants are, are worked with. And so it's really part of the, the vast array of plant medicine that is available, um, on the planet, you know, um, and, uh, you know, Picking and choosing is tar- is hard, so it's very privileged. Yeah. So, anyway, I know that's a convoluted answer to um, uh, uh, that that question, but um, yeah. I really appreciate that sincere answer because it's very nuanced, and it is um, yeah, it's important to not just paper over it and pretend that it's it's simpler than it is. And it's it really uh, it makes me want to ask you a, a second question around conversations between indigenous communities and kind of western medicine i don't know if there are any conversations happening right now and i know that you know part of the conference that you're organizing is as a place to have these conversations between different you know interest groups and different kind of actors and different sectors of of society and industry uh, to some extent you know and science and research but are there any conversations particularly that you know of that are maybe coming f- uh, from people that are in that indigenous tradition um, around their practices um, and potentially wanting to uh, share traditions and skills or kind of have a little bit more control 
autonomy and authority around their kind of healing and medicine modalities? Yeah, I mean, I think I will like leave that conversation to 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 them at the conference, you know, and and um uh there's we've been lucky enough um to have um a number of different uh incredible indigenous scholars, uh, participating in the conference, um, you know, on our advisory committee, um, as part of our, um, speakers list panels, opening ceremony. Um, and, um, you know, again, like one person can't speak for everybody. Three people can't speak with every, for everybody. 10 people can't speak for everybody, but like the more, you know, we listen to different perspectives of people coming from different nations, uh, you know, the more we, we will learn, you know, and, um, and, you know, we in- includes everybody, you know, it's not just like we're in one group and, 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 uh, they're in another group. It's like, we're all having conversation together, hopefully learning from each other, you know? Um, Yeah. So Dominique, I'm picking up on the the vision for the conference being about inclusivity uh, of people's voices that may not normally be profiled at a conference, but also about inclusivity of people that might not normally come to a conference. So it's it's going to be kind of you know on stage and backstage, really everyone there being that we that you were just talking about. Can you talk a, a wee bit more about that vision that you've been working on for the last few years? Yeah, sure. I mean. When we originally founded this event, um, you know, the From Research to Reality Global Summit on Psychedelic Assisted Therapies and Medicine, this conference, like, um, we thought about it being a state of the union um, of the field of psychedelic science. Um, we we realized that um, there were challenges coming up in um, in the field uh, in media um, in, uh, conversation. And we wanted to have a place where all the stakeholders, all the, you know, the people that are interested in psychedelics that are making psychedelic careers, um, could come together and talk together about what do we know, where are we going? Um, you know, what does the future look like? Um, and how do we need to pivot or move forward, um, in order to continue to, be on a path of actually focusing on improvements uh, for mental health, improvements in addictions, um, improvements in people's well-being. Uh, we thought that um, it would be ideal if, in thinking about who was involved in the conference, if we could look at, at uh, a number of different facets of human experience and, and, and diversity and inclusivity uh, you know, think about, um, including people, uh, you know, across, uh, you know, race and ethnicity, uh, gender, sexual identity, um, lived experience, um, discipline, uh, age, you know, uh, all, all disability, you know, all, all a number of different, uh, aspects of, uh, being human, you know, that, that makes us all have different perspectives and viewpoints. And we thought it would be best if, if we were going to make a conference that was truly inclusive, if we had inclusivity at all levels of planning, um, for the conference. And, uh, so we, we did that very carefully, uh, at the beginning, you know, uh, bringing it a lot of, you know, brilliant minds together, um, from, uh, diverse backgrounds, um, and, and using the idea that when we talk about we or them, that really we and them are the same, you know, and, um, I've never liked the categorization of us versus them, you know, uh, in mental health or in addiction work, um, and, uh, or, you know, and I don't want to be a part of any event that is, you know, looks homogenous, um, in who is putting it on or who's, you know, sitting on the stage or, um, who, who is sharing ideas, um, or being allowed to share ideas. Um, and so, yeah, we've worked really hard to, um, uh, 
bring together a number of our perspectives, you know, um, because the people that are putting on this event are uh, coming from a lot of different viewpoints, a lot of different experiences, a lot of different uh, historical and uh, cultural backgrounds, you know. So, yeah, we're hoping that the conversation uh, is evolved because of that. Um, we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. We're really excited. I, I don't know. This is, I think, you know, I think this is going to be a really, really interesting conference that brings together, you know, not only voices from neuroscience, uh, clinical applications, traditional medicine, you know, uh, cultural practice, different cultural practices, public health, and policy perspectives, like we're really like bringing together a lot of different fields um, to uh, figure out where are we going, what's left to do, what's not working, what is working, you know? Sounds fantastic. I love the way you're describing it as a state of the union, that it's not going to be this kind of, you know, annual kind of event. It's, it's being called for a reason. Yes. Um, as, a, as a response to something, perhaps. I don't know, but does, does it feel like the, the timing is ripe or, or it's in response Super to Super ripe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, and even more, you know, because originally we were planning on having this um, this conference in, I think it was, I think their first, originally we were hoping to have it 20, uh, 2020, you know, wow. and, then, and then it quickly became 2021. And then, you know, against all odds, it became 2022, you know, and, and so now we're in a place where we're finally, oh man, I mean, there's so many things. I, I see so many news stories about psychedelics. I see, you know, it really in that kind of cultural lens right now, uh, people are talking about it all the time you hear, there's probably a million podcasts about psychedelics and, you know, news stories about psychedelics and, so this is a really, yeah, a lot of people are coming up to me saying, oh, you know, like we'll come next year or like, or is it happening next year? Or like, I don't know about that weekend. And I'm like, this is a one-time event. This is the state of the union. We've been working on it for three years. Like this has been three years in the making. We've been working so hard to put this together. I'm so excited that the lineup is, is pretty fabulous. If I, you know, it's, and it, and I, I'm not going to take credit for myself because it was, again, like we have this huge international advisory committee of so many beautiful voices. We have an in, incredible planning committee. Um, and, uh, we had a, a, a committee that actually reviewed abstracts. So what's interesting about this conference, um, is that most of the talks that are that are happening at the conference were actually submitted talks. So they were submitted abstracts based on research, based on data, or based on um, you know evidence from practice and uh, and traditional medicine um, that uh, were submitted and reviewed by a committee of peers um, and chosen to present um, you know for presentation. So the array of talks that we have spans. Uh, multiple medicines, multiple disciplines. Um, day one is really focused more on addiction and substance use related harms. Um, days two and three more focused on mental health um, with uh, the end of day one and day three really focused on public health and policy. Um, we've brought together people from um, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, uh, Health Canada, uh, um, the a national Comm commission against addictions in Mexico. Um, uh, what else? The European medicines agencies, uh, European medicines agency. Mm -hmm. um, uh, gosh. Uh, I mean the mental health, co the mental health commission of Canada, Canadian center on substance use and addiction and center for addiction and mental health are our three co-hosts. Um, that's, you know, um, we have, brought together a lot of people that are normally not talking about psychedelics to come to talk together about psychedelics. Um, and so in, as opposed to, you know, we, maybe you've seen lately, there've been some government, let's say day long talks or workshops or conversations about psychedelics, yeah. um, specifically put on by, you know, X, Y, Z group. Um, this is, this is a place where, Everybody's going to come together. So government, regulators, policymakers, 
traditional medicine providers, neuroscientists, clinical practice practitioners. They're going to all come together for the conversation. It's a single track event. So there's not going to be, oh, the neuroscientists are going to that room. The clinical people are going to that room. It's like, no, everybody's in the same room at the same time, listening to all the same stuff. And they're going to learn from each other. That's the idea. We're going to learn from each other, you know, um, so that when we're making decisions moving forward about what works best for people and for us, you know, we're going to have a lot of different viewpoints in the conversation. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. yeah I think having that as a one-off conversation that, that will never happen again, bringing all the people into the room to learn from each other. Um, and particularly that you were saying the papers and the abstracts that, that you've reviewed and that will be available, those, if I understand correctly, haven't been published elsewhere before, that these are fairly novel and, and perhaps, yeah, more kind of minority voices that aren't necessarily going to be published in The Lancet or the, you know, uh, impressive journals. It's, it's a little bit more um, kind of grassroots, would, would you say, some of the papers that we presented. Yeah, who knows? Like we, I mean, we have a real, like again, a real variety of of talks. And you know, I would say, um, I would say, uh, you know, we have late breaking. You know, we realize that the, you know, that even concepts like late breaking research didn't really fit into, you know all cultural paradigms, you know, and, um, and so we, we just have a number of different, um, we have a number of different talks, like from uh, just really incredible people that span a lot of different topics. And I don't think that everyone would, would, yeah, would want to, um, publish their works in, in necessarily in a, um, in a traditional academic journal, although we are going to be, I, the idea is that we're going to be trying to um, get the abstracts published um, uh, after the conference uh, for, you know, for open source availability. But the, yeah, w w most of the, I, I, I mean, we've asked people to submit their original research. So we've asked them to be uh, original novel conversations. So it's not the same talks, the same conversations that you've been hearing before. We've asked them to be as much as possible based on data or recent experience, um, you know, and uh, yeah, we'll see what, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I like how you, you've said a few times, you know, we'll see what happens because, it, you know, you've never done it before, but this <laughs> has never been done before. And it's, yes, it's a lot. I can't imagine what it's like to try and pull this together, to be honest, Dominique. It's been, uh, it's been quite a, quite a learning experience, you know, I, cause one of the, one of the things, one of the other things that, um, we decided to do early on in, in preparing the conference was to be completely nonprofit. Um, and that is, uh, a bit of a set apart in the psychedelics, uh, world. Um, you know, there's plenty of good companies doing good things out there, um, but we really wanted to take money out of the conversation. Um, and, uh, um, so we are, we are including, um, uh, we are limiting like sponsorship and exhibits to not-for-profit institutions. Um, we are having clear like conflicts of interest statements, like across all, all speakers, you know, just so we're clear, like, it's not like you can't talk about something because you're working with XYZ company, but like you have to make sure that, you know, you're not being paid to talk about that thing by XYZ company at the conference, like that you have academic freedom in what you're saying that like, um, that, uh, you know, that the conversations that we're going to be having at this conference are going to, uh, uh, we're, we're aiming for them to be, you know, free of the kind of financial influence that, um, that uh, is often involved. I mean, you know, most people coming to the conference are coming, they're paying to come. They're not uh, being paid to come. And in turn, you know, myself, I have been volunteering on this conference for the last three years. It's been a second, you know, sometimes full-time job uh, that I'm doing just out of passion for uh, the field and learning about psychedelics research and bringing together people for a conversation. It's just something I want to do, and I spend all my free time thinking about it and talking about it and planning for it. You know, um, I'm 
it's pretty nerdy. Um, <laughs> like, what do you do? What do you do for fun? I put on a conference, you know, um, about psychedelics research, you know? Um, uh, but yeah, we're all volunteers, um, uh, which is really cool. Like all the conference planners, all the, um, international advisory committee were volunteering, you know, uh, the people that submitted abstracts, they submitted them without pay, you know? Um, and, uh, it's to in, in to that end we're we're extremely grateful that people you know felt uh, that this venue was a, a venue in which they wanted to speak that this conversation was one that they wanted to be a part of you know people are really gifting their research to the community in that way um, uh, for this conference yeah it's really it's really great um, yeah I have no idea what's going to happen uh, at this conference <laughs> it's it's true I have no idea really hopeful i i think yeah the topics are I, i'm i'm excited i'm ready i'm ready to like sit down and listen to all these talks uh, and there's also you know for people that aren't able to come in person um we have made a virtual attendance option available um so and that's obviously at a much different price point um and as well this is really important to mention um you know, not every, not every, we realize that not everybody's going to want to get deep into the science, like deep into the philosophy, deep into the politics and the, you know, public health aspects of this work, um, or spend three full days, um, of their weekend, uh, you know, it's Memorial Day weekend for the U S uh, folks, um, talking about psychedelics. So, um, we put together a, a panel for Saturday night for a public event. Um, it's just 35 Canadian. I don't know what that is in U S or in euros or, uh, or, um, Mexican or South American currency, you know? Um, but it's, uh, um, it's, it's pr pretty cheap. Um, and, uh, we're bringing together six, uh, you know, kind of world experts on psychedelic assisted therapies and medicines. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, David Nutt um, from Imperial College London, um, Dr. Rick Doblin, who um, you know founded the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, um, Ifitayo Harvey, who is the founder of the People of Color Psychedelics Collective, Education and Advocacy Institution, um, nonprofit, um, Dr. Don D. Davis, um, uh, you know, a scholar um, in studying uh, peyote uh, uh, from a, oh, Idaho, uh, um, Dr. Olivia Marcus, anthropologist, you know, coming from, I think, New York University um, and studying ayahuasca. And this conversation, oh, and Dr. Monica Williams, uh, last but definitely not least, um, you know, who has been a pioneer in researching mental health disparities and uh, psychedelics and kind of racial trauma and um, inclusivity in psychedelics research and practice. And the conversation is going to be led by Dr. Brian Rush, who um, was my uh, former boss that I've mentioned a few times, uh, who has been doing ayahuasca research for a long time, very cool epidemiologist. Um, and yeah, we're really excited about that conversation. Basically, the panel is going to get together and they're going to talk about all the things the public wants to know, you know, what are psychedelics? What are these psychedelic assisted therapies? What do we know about them? Who are they for? You know, what don't we know? Um, uh, you know, and, and people are going to be there to answer questions and kind of have a real conversation. That's going to be really fun. So. That's great. And it's, it's nice that there's the option of virtual as well. If people can't come up to Toronto yes. for that weekend and that they can choose to come to that panel on the Saturday night and hear those fantastic speakers. Okay. So yeah. And talking about, you know, accessibility for the event, you know, we had to be really thoughtful, um, about how, um, again, to include as many people as possible. And while we are a nonprofit and we don't have funding and, you know, it does cost money to put on an event and we do have to charge, um, for tickets, you know, um, we are, we have, connected with a, a number of different institutions around financial subsidies for those who need it, like uh, um, Canadian Center on Substance Use and Addiction has some new subsidies out. Um, this organization called the Source Foundation uh, is giving some scholarships to students who are presenting um, as well. You know, if people are in a serious financial need, you know, we've been responding to emails, you know, um, if people reach out, you know, that want to come, but we also tried to make different price points available for people to engage. Um, 
uh, not only the in-person option, you know, uh, regular student, but also uh, virtually um, one day, two days, three days, all days, you know, and then this public event, which is like 35 Canadian, like I said. Um, so we're hoping that the hybrid nature of the conference really allows as many people as possible to come and participate. Obviously, if you have to fly, you know, I mean, one of our advisory committee members is actually from Australia and he's not able to come, you know, I think because of restrictions. Um, and that would be a very big flight and very expensive, you know, but he's going to participate virtually. I think it might be in the middle of the night, uh, but he's going to be there. <laughs> you know, he, he joined all of our all of our advisory committee meetings. Actually, it would be like two in the morning, three in the morning for him. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. We wow. like troopers Dedication. on our yeah. on our committees, like volunteer troopers. Like, yeah, very, very passionate. Yeah. Yeah, serious dedication from your team to pull this off. And yeah. you said it's, it feels like it's a ripe moment for this to happen. And it yeah. has taken a few years, you know, with COVID happening as well. Um, and having been to other conferences like Horizons and, and uh, Wonderland in Miami, you know, um, it sounds very different. You know, I think Horizons is, is something very special mm -hmm. um, for a lot of people. But yep. this even more so with, you know, with the sense of the for-profit not being involved. Uh, at all and on the other side kind of government being involved like those agencies that are kind of co-partnering with you to to build this and promote this mm -hmm. that's massive and i don't know to what extent that speaks to the canadian uh, government or health canada's approach to psychedelics or the special access program but it, it definitely sends a pretty clear message um to other conferences around the kind of pay to play uh role of of money as well as you know looking at public policy public health as well. Right. It changes the conversation. Mm. Yeah. And who's willing to be involved in the conversation. Yeah. And, and and I think definitely that piece around inclusivity and giving people a chance to to share what they're working on and what yeah. their vision is and what they're finding in the real world. Whereas in most conferences they probably wouldn't get onto that agenda. Yeah. Some really, really exciting talks. Yeah. You know, uh um one of my friends um, recently submitted a talk uh, like through the late breaking portal, you know, mm. about um, his experience of, uh, you know, learning Shipibo medicine um, as, you know, uh, um, a black man in New York City, like, you know, going to the Amazon to study and learn and, and, and use that, um, study to help work through his own experiences of, uh, racial trauma, you know, and, uh, I'm so excited for his talk and, you know, there's, you know, an, another talk, I mean, this conversation about the intersection of science and spirituality, uh, is something that's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts, you know, about, uh, you know, how do we talk about spirituality in science? Like, how do we talk about, how do we talk about science and spirituality? How, how do they, how do they commingle? You know, how do they intersect? How do they complement each other? Those, those, um, those fields. And then, you know, having the conversation with, uh, you know, folks from different agencies on day three government agencies about, you know, what are the practices happening in different countries right now? Like what, what are, what are, what's the playing field like in each country? Like how are, how are, um, different agencies thinking about, uh, psychedelics and, you know, potential for, uh, mental health and addiction and phys physical health, all kinds of, you know, things like who knows. Um, but how is that conversation going? What kind of research is being done? What kind of research is being allowed? You know, how do people have access to these substances to research them? How do people have access to these substances to, uh, potentially cope with or heal from, you know, life-threatening, illnesses like we've like we've learned about you know special access for uh you know depression at end of life um, with psilocybin we we know about expanded access um clinics you know in that or applications for clinics in in uh in the u.s like with mdma you know uh for post-traumatic stress disorder um we know that in you know the netherlands People are working with uh, psilocybin, you know, based uh, medicines, uh, you know, mushrooms, truffles to, well, truffles, sorry, um, to, uh, you know, address um, 
issues around mental health, you know, so we know that these things are happening in different countries. We know that in South America, there are certain countries where, you know, these medicines are very available and legal, you know? Um, so yeah. And it's, it's really nice that that the inclusivity and the kind of conversation sharing is happening on multiple levels on, on one kind of interpersonal level. Yep. Different communities and different experiences kind of being part of a conversation but then just globally like looking at what's happening in other countries or how are other governments relating to you know psychedelics and what can we learn and it would be great wouldn't it if 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 our government and all governments could could just talk with each other about this because you know particularly with mental health and addiction being you know really really significantly impacted right now and for for a lot of us particularly with covid it feels like these conversations are pretty pretty urgent and they need to be had at, at the government level but also you know at the ground with with clinicians therapists researchers and and people that are, you know are struggling themselves and that's why i love what you're saying about that person that's presenting kind of that last minute paper about his experiences that you know when he was in new york and and using uh, plant medicine for his healing it's so important that we just hear that real real life well, story. not in not in new york but but uh, abroad yeah but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah yeah so so yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Lots of interesting talks. We're going to have one from um, someone from the FDA on um, like the history of psychedelics, like in the U.S., like in policy, like from the 1960s to now. Um, you know, we're going to have um, a conversation on day one about um, about addictions and psychedelics. Like, um, you know, I'm still, I'm still. I'm tweaking with the panel a little bit. Okay. But the, the, you know, the folks we've got uh, talking with me right now um, on that day are um, Ken, Dr. Ken Tupper um, from BC uh, ministry of um, health. And uh, he is uh, coming from more public health uh, perspective. Well, he's got really coming from UBC um, mm-hmm. university of British Columbia. Um, and uh, he's talking about like public health and addiction and if it's Ohio Harvey from People Call Their Psychedelics Collective, Dr. Ben Sessa um, from, you know, Imperial College London, you know, uh, you know, and uh, and probably a couple of other folks, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, I've invited some someone from the, uh, the National Commission Against Addictions in uh, Mexico. Um, so yeah, we can have a really interesting conversation about addictions research and, and, and paths forward for addiction. This is something that's come up a lot recently is like, can we use, can we use psychedelic medicines and therapies um, to heal uh, addictions? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just wanted to ask if people can't attend virtually or in person, will you be offering recorded access to this for people that want to to come back, potentially pay for that yeah we we are um we are currently requesting recording permission from all the speakers so it will be kind of depending on how each speaker decides to go uh you know we're assuming that mm-hmm. most most speakers will agree to be recorded um and that some might not but so live is the best way to go but like definitely um as much of as, as much of the conference as possible that can be recorded, we will be recording. The same with the uh, public event. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah. before we uh, bring our chat to a, an end, Dominique, any pieces around the conference that we didn't get to cover yet that you feel like we, we have to include? Sounds great so far, seriously. So, so yeah, I mean, I guess just to summarize, you know, what we're doing, like what the last, uh, the bulk of my last uh, three years has been spent on um, in terms of time, uh, you know, so our conference is called From Research to Reality, Global Summit on Psychedelic Assisted Therapies and Medicine. It is, and I haven't even mentioned this yet, it is May 27th to 29th, uh, right. 2022. This is Memorial Day weekend in the U.S. It is the weekend after um, our Canada long weekend, um, uh, but uh, it's three days: Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And uh, this event is a one-time, one-time only. You know, I sound like a a salesperson right now, but it's a one-time only event. You know, that's going to bring together researchers, clinicians, traditional medicine providers, policymakers, and regulators from around the world to discuss the state of research on psychedelic assisted therapies and medicine and its translation to policy and practice. And, you know, it's unique in being nonprofit. It's unique in its kind of diversity of topics. 
Uh, it's like single track. Um, you know, we prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion. The event is co-hosted by three institutions, um, Center for Addiction and Mental Health, Mental Health Commission of Canada, and the Canadian Center on Substance Use and Addiction. Uh, and on Saturday night, um, the May 28th, we're going to feature a special in-person and virtual public event uh, with some of the world's top researchers in the field of psychedelic assisted therapies. That's accessible to anybody curious about psychedelics um, in the treatment of mental health and addictions. And it's going to cover the latest research in the in the field, opportunities in the psychedelics industry, um, indigenous and cultural perspectives, and much more. And, you know, I will just note one thing, like, while, you know, while industry, you know, voices we haven't, while we, while we haven't taken money uh, from them, we are still hoping that people from industry are going to be at the conference, you know, like this, every, we want everybody to be part of the conversation. Everybody's important, you know, without industry, like none of these things are going to come into, you know, fruition in, in treatment or clinical practice, you know? Um, so I, I, there's an, we're no way diminishing the importance, you know, of industry involvement. So um, it's just that this conference is about the research, the knowledge um, sharing uh, aspect of, of this work. Um, so yeah, it's going to be at the Toronto Hilton uh, downtown. Um, it's going to be sunny. It's, it is sunny in Canada um, at that time of year. Um, and so hopefully we'll be pretty warm. We'll see. And, uh, you know, there's options for virtual attendance and our website is from research to reality.com from research to reality.com, uh, research to reality.com is a different website. Ah, so, so you need the from, okay. from. you need the from. <laughs> <laughs> and you so, yeah. said it's at the Hilton. So anyone who's collecting Hilton points, maybe that's a good, even yes. better time to go. <laughs> um, I collect Marriott points and not, not Hilton, but never mind. Um, is accommodation at the Hilton or do you have other places booked out for folks? Yeah, we have accommodation at the Toronto Hilton. We have like a booking, oh, cool. like if you go to the website, there's a passcode that you can use to book to like guarantee a particular rate. Um, but yeah, people, people can stay wherever they want really. You know, I've, yeah. uh, I've definitely, you know, a couple people sleeping on it, you know, on my couch. Uh, so. <laughs> okay. So that's you know. booked up already. Good. It's booked up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's wonderful. And how much um, would you say is, is going to be looking you know, at the connect Canada specific field um, rather than, I know you've got people coming from all over the world, but does it have a particular Canadian focus or would you say it's actually not so much? Well, you know, you know, I'm a dual citizen. I'm American and Canadian. Um, got my Canadian citizenship about uh, three years ago, um, almost four years ago. Um, and in choosing like the planning committee, um, everyone on our planning committee is uh, is in Canada. Um, everyone on our advisory committee is all over the place, all over the world. Um, so is there a, a Canadian lens? Uh, probably, yeah. Um, but is, so is it a part of the conversation? Absolutely. You know, uh, but because we didn't want to be just focused on what's happening in Canada, um, we made huge efforts to make sure that it was really international in scope and like that, um, that there were many different conversations about what's going all over the world, uh, to be had. So, um, so there's going to be people talking about the state of, uh, work and research and practice in Canada, but there's also going to be people talking about that um, in, you know, in, uh, South America and the U S and Europe and UK, like, um, so, um, wonderful. Yeah. So no, I don't I, know is the question. Yeah. I just don't know. Yeah. yeah. It, it hasn't happened. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll have you back on after to say, so how yeah. did it go? <laughs> but no, seriously, I want to, um, yeah, just congratulate you and your team for sticking through this, through the pandemic and, making it happen nonprofit is is phenomenal to make that happen and um the vision's beautiful um to bring people together that everyone is an equal partner and has a place in the conversation but not to dominate it but we right. want to have as many voices heard there that maybe don't normally get heard in in uh, some of these settings so yeah it sounds phenomenal uh and i really hope um it's a fantastic success dominique yeah me too me too yeah
thanks for letting me talk so much about it. <laughs> no, you're welcome. <laughs> no, it sounds great. And um, yeah, if anyone uh, wants to know, we'll put all the information in our show notes from Research to Reality, May 27th to 29th in Toronto. So I hope to be there. We'll see what we can do on that long weekend. Yes. And um, yeah, so Dr. Dominique Morisano, it's been a true pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the Psychedelics Today podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take care. God bless everyone. Bye.